Hi, this is Dan Adius, and you're listening to Cinepod, the cinematography podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ilya. Hey, Ben. How are you? I am Ducky. How are you? Hanging in there. Hey, you know what? Uh, just right off the top of my head, dear listener, don't forget to go check out assemble.tv and enter the code Cinepod for a free month on us. So assemble.tv, you can go to our YouTube channel and you can check out all the, the cool stuff that assemble.tv can do for you. Yes. Yeah, if you're getting ready, if you're listening to the sound of my voice and you're getting ready to do any kind of production, try out assemble for your production. It keeps all your assets and by assets, I mean all your pre-production, all your auditions, all your edits, all everything as you, as you go along and it keeps everything in order and enables you if you're the producer to like decide who knows what and when and how information is disseminated and you don't have to ask anyone else to join assemble in order to use it. It's damn good. Ben, I've got their new tagline assemble.tv. It'll save your assets. That's a good, that's a good idea. We should give that's that to good. them. That's, we should, we that one, give that, that one's free. That's free. All right. Enjoy. Uh, all right, Ben, who's on the show today? This is an awesome, awesome interview. I'm very excited to present it to people. Uh, a gentleman named Dan Adius, who I knew as the director of Stephen King's Silver Bullet in the 1980s, mm. but who, as it turns out, has gone on to direct, uh, God knows, hundreds of hours of some of the best television uh, that, on, on television and has been doing it since the 80s, really. And he's an amazingly interesting person to talk to. He knows so much about his craft, about directing. He brings so much to it. And I'm really blown away because it kind of answers the question, you know, whenever we have someone on here who is a DP of, of a TV series, be it Ozark, be it the strain, be it whatever. My first question is always like, so when you bring in a guest director, like how do you get those motherfuckers in line? And uh, <laughs> it was really interesting to hear it from uh, Dan's point of view, because he really puts a lot of thought into every episode he directs, whether he's a guest director on a show or uh, there are shows like Homeland where he directed tons and tons of episodes. And uh, his kind of thinking I think is is the kind of thing that we should all be striving for when we're making a film project, whether you're a DP or a director. And as we're always talking about, we're here to drill down and ask the questions about art, craft and philosophy. And this guy was all three of those. He, he was brilliant. And I should say he has written a book called Directing Great Television, which I didn't read it so much as I devoured it. It was really it was a great read. Very interesting. Very telling. And uh, we're going to be giving away an autographed copy of Directing Great Television to some lucky listener. And we will have information on our Instagram. Speaking of Instagram, what a natural transition this is. Uh, I, think, I think we have to get meta here for a second. Oh, we no. Have to, <laughs> look at you. <laughs> we have to bring in Instagram's parent company, Facebook, as like our, our close focus today, because, you know, Facebook, they're embattled at the moment in sort of a PR crisis. Of course, they had a whistleblower come forward and say, like, you know, Facebook knows that how incredibly damaging their yeah. their uh, algorithms are and the way that they, they put forth their, their apps. And, <laughs> in and, other uh, news, water yeah. is wet and fire is hot. <laughs> there, there wasn't a lot of doubt about this, but I think what was really particularly damning was uh, how Instagram molds young minds and how they, they knew about well, you know, it. And how, like one of the yeah. things, and this has been kind of a controversy, is that they were trying to roll out Instagram for kids. That's right. That's right. They wanted the kids version. So, yeah, you get them young, get them hooked. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I don't think a lot of people know that Facebook bought like they took over a building in Hollywood and they have sort of uh, a goal of moving and morphing sort of Facebook watch and Facebook into the entertainment industry, into sort of like traditional. Well, they bought uh, Oculus early yeah. on and uh, they have part of the whole meta thing is that they're going to be doing a lot of entertainment related stuff in VR, meaning... They're going to be making hardware. 
Yeah, and I think it's an interesting business model because I'm um, pretty much everyone else who's tried doing that has failed so far or has mm-hmm. spent a bunch of venture capital and didn't ever return any of the promises. That virtual reality sort of space is not the space that the investing community thought that it was. And uh, the fact that people are still uh, dropping money into it and saying, like, oh, just wait, there'll be new goggles. They're really rolling the dice big time on here, and I'll explain it again. The reason 3D failed, the reason VR is failing, is that when most people go home, they don't want to put, um, and and certainly people who wear glasses like myself, they don't want to put something bigger and heavier and less comfortable on their face. They want to have a beer. They want to sit down. They don't want to just, like, you know, suit suit up their armor. Well, I do know people who enjoy a good VR video game. I am not one of them, but I know people who are who enjoy That's the VR game. That's not the gaming. same thing. I don't, I, and I don't think that a video game is passive entertainment the way. No, no, it, yeah. it's it's absolutely not passive entertainment. So, I, yeah, I don't necessarily think that people want to abandon the storytelling of directors and cinematographers from, let's say, Stranger Things, and now have the Stranger Things VR experience. Can, can or, I tell you? Uh, can I can I bring up my VR experience? By the way. Please. Our good friend, Tim Johnson, when he still ran Blacklist, helped me out because he had these amazing VR rigs that he'd created. And we did an episode of 20 Seconds to Live that we shot in VR, but we also shot it normally. So we shot it in VR one day, then brought the same cast back the next day and shot it like a regular thing. Yeah. And we released the regular one. The VR one just became a boondoggle of tech, just a serious headache. And when it came down to it, as a viewer... It just wasn't fun. As a viewer, you had to decide where to look all the time. And if you were looking in the wrong place, you could just watch one of the characters who wasn't talking for three quarters of it and you wouldn't notice the difference. I found it to be uh, a little awkward, but I have seen VR projects. Like I remember at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2016, they had a huge VR thing. Like they had a whole hall where they had tons of VR stuff and there were some really cool things in it, but they were all... I would say it was more like art. It was more like experiencing art in a way where you could look around it much more than it was trying to watch a story. All of the ones that were good. Yeah, I think that there's a long way to go, but I think that the analogy with art or going to an art gallery or having some sort of experience or educational experience is probably best suited for that technology versus the idea of you're going to watch a movie or you're going to do this. You're going to do what the the passive entertainment sort of... My guess is someday someone's going to crack the code and figure out how to do it i just Uh, wonder (laughs) if enough people are currently on a vr platform like you know there's all this talk about apple glasses which maybe are going to be coming out and i think that that's more about augmented reality than virtual reality absolutely 100 percent. that's what that is yeah i wonder if there will have anything built into that the person i know the perfect person to bring on and talk about this his name is mike (laughs) orlay and he's a friend of mine and he was one of the people who was instrumental in creating the hollow lens and he showed it to me they had some educational programs so you could go to like machu picchu and look around and i'm like yeah that's all cool it still is i agree with you it's, it's a hard sell for me to be like hey wear this bicycle helmet that goes over your eyes which is what the hollow lens is it really is <laughs> that's, uh, well, that's at totally the time that. he even told me like this version is like this is version one and it's you know it's going to get better and it's going to get smaller and i think that a lot of that the technology to cr- to make that stuff work smaller and lighter just takes years and years and years of R&D. Yeah, there's a long way off and it's going to be a very expensive road for the people who believe that they have to pioneer this right now so that they can But if you're Facebook, you got the money. I mean, like, oh, excuse That's me, true. Meta. 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 Yeah. It's not just a rebranding. Like, they're going to be doing a bunch of VR, AR, whatever. And like you're talking, they have a, a not insignificant investment in Hollywood. Yeah, it won't be boring. May you live in interesting times. These are interesting times. Oh, yeah, yeah. We live in interesting times. (laughs) Maybe too interesting. I would like to live in some boring times. I wouldn't mind being bored a little bit more. Remember, (laughs) remember like a whole week would go by and you'd be like, oh, wow, Lost was underwhelming. Like that was the worst (laughs) thing that happened to you. Uh. (laughs) Your water cooler talk just got, you know, way way less interesting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that episode was, yeah, didn't didn't really work for me. So anyway, (laughs) hey, uh, let's get to the interview. All right, here is Dan Adius. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. All right, so I'm here today with the amazing, one of the most prolific TV directors on the planet and uh, the writer of the new book, Directing Great Television, Dan Adius. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Dan. Thank you, Ben. I'm delighted to be here. I would be remiss 
if I didn't start by proclaiming my love of your feature that kind of got you into the industry, Silver Bullet, and uh, because we're a cinematography podcast, I also happen to notice that your cinematographer from that also shot Stephen King's Maximum Overdrive. So he had, those are like two of his only uh, American films that I saw were Silver Bullet adapted from the Stephen King, uh, it was a like a graphic novel, wasn't wow, it? Wow, like you, you really know that well. Yeah, Armando Nanuzzi, wonderful, wonderful cinematographer. It was my first job. It was for Dino De Laurentiis, and Armando didn't speak a word of English. And oh, wow. It was quite interesting. He spoke a little kind of broken French, and that was about the extent of my French. So we would communicate that way, but what a gentleman. And I, you mentioned Maximum Overdrive. Apropos of nothing, really, I guess, but he had a terrible accident on that. There was He lost an eye. Oh, did he? Yeah, he lost <gasps> an eye on it. Can you imagine that for a cinematographer? Oh. Man, an accident that's horrible. In, in filming, yeah. But anyway, lovely gentleman and uh, really helped me on my my first job, Silver Bullet. Yeah, yeah. The world needs more werewolf movies. But um, let's kind of start a little bit earlier with kind of how you got to the point to even get to direct a movie like Silver Bullet. Could you talk about sort of your education and kind of what set you down the path of directing? Yeah, it was a bit uh, circuitous because when I got out of undergraduate work, uh, I was an English major. I got into law school. I didn't want to go. I deferred my admission. And kind of as a way to loosen myself up and learn to be a little bit more willing to be playful in my imagination, I, I started taking acting classes. And I fell in love with that because it really activated me. It really opened up my imagination and gave me permission in ways that uh, I guess I hadn't felt before. And for about three years, I studied diligently to to be an actor, be a professional actor. And that has turned out to be the best training I think I've ever gotten as a director. But in that pursuit of acting, strangely, I won't go into the details of why this happened, but I wound up being enrolled in a critical studies master's program at UCLA. Really, oh, wow. really I was just trying to take advantage of the acting classes. And I did some, I did oh. some acting. But <laughs> as a result of that, there was a requirement in critical studies that the students make a film just to kind of, I guess, get to understand what they would be writing about, talking about. And I made a Super 8 film that was the uh, format in those days. And it was just the epiphany for me. I said, this is home. Uh, because I was, oh, really, wow. I was really able to get out of my own way and much more easily than I could as an actor. As an actor, I understood scenes pretty well and I could analyze them, knew what they were about, knew what the requirements were for the scenes. But I really had trouble kind of wrenching around my insides to put me in the proper <laughs> state. And uh, what was funny about that, interesting about that, I sometimes think of a sports metaphor for that because often in professional sports, like in baseball, the best managers... And coaches are the ones that really struggled to kind of hang on in the major leagues for a little while because their natural talent couldn't carry them. They had to really kind of figure out, you know, how to hang on, how to make, take advantage of limited talent. And I think that was probably true of me as an actor. So huh. when I could work with wonderful, talented people who really had a full access to their inner resources in a way, I mean, I, I feel I have that access as well, but to let it emerge in the way of in, in you actually embodying a, a character, uh, when I work with people who have that kind of access, it's a thrill for me. And I can, I think, assist them because I've been there and I've de I developed in so many ways to just kind of make my performance passable that when I have someone who has access, <laughs> you know, a few little hints or clues might really set them off in exciting ways. So, so that was when I determined I wanted to be a director. And then I was in film school for a couple of years and I transferred into an MFA program and I really didn't have a thesis film I wanted to make and I saw the lifelong film, the stars of the department who were kind of the big fish in the small pond wanting to kind of hang on and I didn't want to be that guy. So I didn't have a, a film I wanted to make and I thought, well, what, what can I do until I figure that one out? And I applied for the Directors Guild Assistant Directors Training Program thinking, well, maybe I'll apprentice to good directors not really understanding then that an assistant director doesn't really assist directing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I got into the program and I worked for uh, about a year and a half and then I got my guild card and I was a second AD and I worked for another couple of years. And when I was you know eligible to move up to first AD, I had no interest in that. That was when I went back to film school, uh, made had now had a film I wanted to make, 
made a dramatic short, a dramatic comedy actually that uh, was about 30 minutes and it won a bunch of film festivals. I'm still very proud of it. And uh, funnily enough, I had just finished working as a second AD on E.T., the extraterrestrial. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. I, I had a pretty good career as an AD. I worked for Francis Coppola on One from the Heart and for Vim Vendors on Hammett and George Miller for his episode of The Twilight Zone, the movie. Whoa! So yeah, I accumulated some pretty, some pretty cool experiences. But I went back, made this film. Through it, I got an agent. And that agent happened to be the guy that people would sometimes go to who would who was known for finding young talented people that wouldn't cost much and Dino was uh, <laughs> Dino was right in line to make that call and uh, he had silver bullet and I went in and interviewed for that and made my pitch and met uh, Stephen King who was just an incredible gentleman and that's how I got started and didn't Bernie Wrightson draw the the graphic novel or the illustrations that were in that book it was like a hev- heavily illustrated book I I don't it was called Cycle I, I of don't the werewolf. Cycle I know of werewolf. Too much it was this. actually a calendar. It wasn't even a book. It was uh-huh. uh, it had every month. And when Dino wanted to turn it into a movie, Stephen had to really kind of throw over all the many of the conventions of werewolf movies because uh-huh. it, it had to take place in a condensed period of time. So the werewolf would make his appearance like several times during the month. It wasn't just the full moon when he came out. Yeah. So that was different from the from the calendar. But yes, it was. Uh, I don't know if it was even a graphic novel as much as a graphic calendar with a description of what happened each month. Oh, yeah. I just I, I have the book Cycle of the Werewolf somewhere, and I think Bernie writes and drew it. Anyway, I, I don't know that I've ever had anyone on the show, by the way, who could talk about working with Dino De Laurentiis, who was kind of a legendary figure. And, and he broke people like yourself, like Sam Raimi. You know, he gave Sam Raimi a big uh, boost. He gave David Lynch a big boost. And I remember as a kid when a Dino De Laurentiis movie would come out. I knew it was going to be genre. The qual- You wouldn't know about the quality, but it w- they were kind of fun to see. It's not a comparison to canon films, because canon films were almost intentionally over the top and sometimes on the trashier side. De Laurentiis was like trying to make movies that felt like big movies. And, and he also, early in his career, was a producer for Vittorio De Sica. And yeah. uh, I mean, he was a real filmmaker. I mean, he loved yeah. film and you're right. He clearly loves spectacle. And uh, I, I really am tra- I value very much my experience with him. And I don't know if you want to hear a story or two about that. I would love to because in the book and, and I promise we're going to get to directing great television, uh, your, your new book. But I, I would love to hear a little bit about the making of that movie, because I mean, like that movie's falling right around the time of the, the 80s are kind of like this haven of, of there's like an explosion of, of imaginative horror movies. Two of the best werewolf movies, in my humble opinion, come out of that exact period of time. American Werewolf in London and The Howling. And I would put Silver Bullet in that in that same category. And you've got stuff like Stuart Gordon's movies, you know, Reanimator from Beyond, stuff like that. And I, I feel like it was at that time genre movies movies were like a cauldron of new ideas and new ways of doing things. Yeah, and they were also kind of the entry-level job for young directors because horror mo- yeah. movies could be made for a price and uh, plentifully as well. Uh, there was a lot of interesting things about <laughs> Silver Bullet. It was a co-production with Paramount, and Dino was a very shrewd businessman, and I, I think... You know, we had very little money to spend on anything, really. I'm, I, you know, I'm not sure that Paramount didn't wind up financing the whole movie thinking it was paying for half of it, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and what was fascinating, I mean, one of the fascinating things about it was The Werewolf des- was designed by Carlo Rambaldi, with whom I had worked just three years prior on E.T. because Carlo Rambaldi designed mm-hmm. E.T., so Carlo had no money to work with, and we didn't uh, really get any idea of what the world was. We saw some renderings, but we got well into, you know, deep into prep, and we still hadn't seen it. And, you know, I'll be frank with you. I was disappointed, as I think most people were, with what the werewolf looked like because, I mean, some of the reviews were not kind in that regard. It was like a guy in a bear suit, you know, because we had an animatronic head and we had this bear suit that somebody actually wore. But there was a lot of concern when we finally saw it. I mean, Dino wanted to delay production. We couldn't. So, you know, a lesson I, you know, learned about horror and and put into effect was that, you know, sometimes the scariest thing is what you don't see. So we saw very little of the werewolf until the very ending. And the, the, the final amalgam of it all was interesting. The reviews were not kind on the film, which actually 
pointed me away from features because what happened was I said, well, wait a minute, don't you see what I did? How can, but the director takes responsibility for everything in a feature. Mm -hmm. And and so I said, well, the next feature I do is going to be more my sensibility. And, uh, you know, and I was waiting so long, I turned down things and, and all that. But Ebert kind of saw that I was trying to be a little cheeky and bring some humor into it, which I thought the material lent itself to. So in rehearsal, Stephen King could not have been nicer or more supportive of uh, me as the director getting to do whatever I wanted with his material. I don't think this was a project of his, uh, which he felt particularly uh, like he wanted to be very involved with. I mean, I think he was aware this was a calendar that he had kind of turned into a script. (laughs) I think at that time, uh, it was the law that every three months a new Stephen King movie had to come out. Like there was there were so many Stephen King movies that were coming out right around that time. But what I love, too, is, you know, I immediately saw I wanted to turn this into uh, I I wanted for Uncle Red Gary Busey. And, you know, this was my first film. I had a cameraman who didn't speak a lick of English. English. And they're saying, are you nuts? I mean, Busey at that time was known for, I mean, as he still is, is having drug issues and he hadn't worked mm-hmm. for a while. But I just had loved him so much in uh, the Buddy Holly story. And oh, he's I, just, great, I man. just think he's amazing. And we got him and, you know, he was very overweight because I think largely because he was going off of drugs and he was just eating a lot. But he was so perfect. I think it's one of the great best performances I've ever seen him give. He's, he's so charming and funny and, and childlike. And, uh, you know, finally, my directing, it's funny. I mean, here I am, my first time directing, and I've got two kids who were the, who were the leads with, with Gary, and Gary was by far the most needy of any of them. <laughs> you know, he was like the well, biggest that kid of all. Goes without saying. You know, so that was, uh, that was fun. Some of, some of the most professional actors I've ever worked with were under the age of 15. <laughs> like, and then I'll just say one other thing, too. The, the themes of it, what, I think what got me the job was... You know, I really was comp- really found it compelling and fascinating the whole kind of theme of what of, of woundedness. You know, you had mm-hmm. you had the boy in the wheelchair, uh, Corey Haim, may he rest in peace, who is this spunky, alive, vital kid, and yet he's paralyzed, and uh, so he's got a wound. And you've got, of course, the werewolf, who's who's the priest, who's wounded by his own. Uh, guilt and and sense of his own imperfections trying you know unable to meet up to his standards and you had the uncle the alcoholic and i found it so fascinating the way the story could be viewed as you know if you can accept your wounds if you accept the reality of them not not like them but if you accept that they're there they're a reality that's your way through them and to survive and the alcoholic uncle, you know, was in denial, and he that's why his life was going down the drain. Uh, the werewolf, of course, the priest couldn't accept it, and that turned, and so he metaphorically turned into a monster. And yet the one mm-hmm. who did accept it was the boy. Even as you're talking just now, talking about Silver Bullet, something that really resonated with me as I was reading your book uh, is coming up, which is that I feel like you have an uncanny sense of looking at a piece of written material and kind of pulling the theme right out of it and then figuring out a visual way to show the theme, which I think is, is pretty awesome and amazing. And, you know, as I was reading the book and, you know, the first show you talk about directing was Miami Vice. And that was kind of a baptism by fire for you. But then the next one was uh, the next one you talk about was Beauty and the Beast. And you talk about really deeply delving into the themes of the story of the episode. And I, I guess that's something that, you know, because we, we talked uh, on this podcast, we talked to a lot of DPs who shoot television. And I always kind of ask the same question about guest directors coming in. Like how much legroom does a guest director have to interpret material when the DP knows what it's supposed to look like? Like if you asked for, you talk about the lens baby in house, for instance, if you ask for something like that, and it's like, that's just not how they do it. Does the DP kind of step in and be like, eh, yeah, you know, like how much of a, of a moderator are they? But your book is kind of mind expanding to me in, in terms of like the amount of interpretation you have can you talk about when you're going to a new tv show you know you're always kind of diving for that theme and like how do you go about finding it yeah well you brought up you know uh, many of the really essential opportunities and challenges of directing series television and uh you know i learned very early you mentioned that that that, uh, those two early experiences of mine were really as you say, trials by fire, but they, they also, I sometimes think of it as kind of getting hit upside the head. And they both really were 
while at the time I went through them, they were they were challenging and unpleasant in many ways. They were probably, you know, some of the most significant and helpful experiences I had based on the lessons I, I gleaned from them. And I'll, I'll return to that. But some of the themes, some of the questions you ask. One thing I, I learned very early is that if I don't care about a story, if I don't find a way to care about the show I'm directing, then I really can't make anybody else care about it. Mm-hmm. I, ha- I have to get personally invested in uh, the story I'm telling, because it's only then that my own inner resources are activated. It's only then that my own curiosity, that my own... And I do believe in that, by the way. I believe that we, if we can figure out what, you know, what we're curious about or what we don't understand, but we're intrigued by, that something gets activated within us and, and answers can come or possibilities yeah. arise. And uh, if, I, if I couldn't work that way, I, don't, I just don't think I'd be very effective. So any, any script I approach, I'm looking for what interests me. And if I don't find something, then I have to figure out what could interest me with these givens. Now, when I approach a show, I mean, the writers have thought about this particular episode. I'm being handed a lot more than I have. I mean, often you don't get, in series television, you don't get your script until, you know, sometimes the day before you're supposed to, you have your seven or eight days to prep it. And, you know, so you haven't... Yeah, and and by then you've already agreed to direct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I never, you never know as as a guest director what material you're going to get when you agree to be on the show. You, you know, you know the show, it's not, hopefully, unless it's a new show entirely. You know, one thing I'll do on a show that's been ongoing for a little while is I'll immerse myself in it as much as I can. I'll watch as many of the episodes as I can. I'll, and if I'm in the middle of the season, my show, I'll be, I'll ask to get sent all the scripts leading up to mine. Because, you know, the, really the golden age of TV, I think, is partly resulted from shows being serialized where you, you, they have like a whole many, many episodes to tell the story. So it's like a novel, a great novel, and you're just being entrusted with one chapter. Uh, yeah. so, I'll, so I'll get immersed in it and I'll develop my own ideas that, of how the show works. I'll also sit with the writers or the showrunner. There's something called a tone meeting in episodic television that is the, the director's opportunity to really explore every scene with the writers and, and really understand and ask them for what was in their mind when they were writing it, what, what, what are the underlying themes. And really, a question I often ask, which is an important one, is, is what is the story being told? Because I think this is often an unacknowledged area in, in directing of any kind, features or television, is that the story is not simply what happens. The story is the meaning that you give to what happens, that where you're directing, the audience is focused. So it's the director's job to help the audience understand what is at stake, what is at issue. It's not simply what happens. And hopefully the writers have given a lot of thought to this in advance of my arriving. So I'll sit with them and I'll go through every scene and I'll ask them, okay, what is the story about here? What, what's the point of view of this particular scene? And how does it fit into this larger story you're telling? So I'll go through every, every scene. And this is what writer producers do with every, yeah, every director who's on a show. They'll, they'll have this tone meeting and they'll talk about important things they want, points of emphasis. But when I hear this, I have to then consult myself because that's really the fundamental director's question is how do I feel about this? It's like that's the only that's the only resource I really have. It's the deepest resource I have. It's the it's the one. Yeah. That, it's it's what any of us have. We bring ourselves, and if we forsake that, if you look for somebody else to, uh, if you try to please somebody else, that's a dangerous thing to do. At the same time, you're in the funny position of serving the showrunner's vision. So you're having to, in a sense, please that one as well. But my view always is, I have to make it my story to tell. I have to be the storyteller when it's when I'm directing it. And, and mm-hmm. it's like my and I have to arrive at something that compels me about it. Hopefully it'll exactly mirror the showrunner and the writer's idea about what's compelling to them. But sometimes it can't. Sometimes it doesn't. And in those instances, I have to find a way to honor the intentions of the writers, you know, give them what they want, but but go deeper for myself. And, you know, often I've had the experience that I find something that's exciting to me. The actors are excited by it. We do it. And the writers may not even recognize that there's anything different from what they had told me in the tone meeting. 
fortunately for several years, have been you know able pretty much to make myself employable on shows that intrigue me. And I'm I'm often drawn to things I've never done before or ways of seeing that are that are not you know the way I normally see because I know for me to direct, I'm going to have to get so immersed in it, I'm going to have to make it the way I see. And not just mimic a style, but really learn to see that way. And it will open up, you know, it's exciting to me. It can open up new worlds. One of the things, uh, you know, when looking at the span of your career, it's not just that you've done so many different TV shows, but you've done TV shows in like virtually every genre. You know, you've done stuff that is straight up comedy. You've done, you know, like, uh, I don't know if I would call Northern Exposure straight up comedy, but you know, it's funny. Well, it's always uh, sunny in Philadelphia is pretty straight up comedy. I was a producer true, on that, true, producer yeah. director on that. And But then like, you know, Grey's Anatomy, True Blood, uh, Homeland, Billions. I mean, like it's unusual to even talk to a cinematographer or a, a feature director who's worked in as many genres as you have. And all of them really do kind of have a signature look, a feel, a way the lines are delivered, kind of a, a tone, a, a feeling. And I'm interested to know how you go about kind of getting under the skin of, uh, you know, getting into the DNA of those shows. It's a wonderful opportunity. I, I regard it as a wonderful opportunity to get to immerse in a way of being that is is different. And so I love finding these different kind of ways mm-hmm. to, to experience myself and to experience the world. But something else is kind of, uh, I've, I've realized is probably goes to some of, I guess, my deeper motivations because I realize that Part of what drew me to wanting to be an actor is precisely that, to be able to inform different roles and to be able to kind of experience different, different realities. So I think, you know, I do, I do really enjoy accepting the rules and the givens of a particular genre and then really trying to explore them as deeply as I can. In case of comedy, you don't necessarily think about depth necessarily, but richness. And uh, I had a great experience just within the last couple of years doing The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which is just yeah. so zany and madcap. And to do that well, you have to kind of, uh, I find, I mean, that's my approach, I guess. I really try to embody the energy of the show myself. And it's, I mean, it's, it, it, it's true. I mean, when, you, when you're doing a comedy, you just think differently than you do if you're doing a heavy drama. And I think actors who are good at that really just understand it. I had a funny experience once with Gandolfini on The Sopranos, which I think is, in addition to being a great mobster show, is an incredibly funny show as well. And uh, I mentioned this in the book in the chapter on... Uh, getting the performance but you know sometimes you go to great lengths to kind of really create the imaginary circumstances for the actor help them with backstory help them any way you can help them plug into their process and and be supportive and you know however you can but sometimes you can be a little precious and worried about i don't know being prescriptive or, or or telling them how to do it but i remember with gandolfini once i was coming up to him to give him a note and i was kind of using a lot of well it's kind of and he just looked at me says do you want it funnier and I said, I said, actually, yes. And he just knew exactly what to do. And he did it. You know, it's just yeah, yeah. you have that sense of what would do it. And, you know, as in directing, it's the same thing. It's like and again, it goes to that question. I just want to, to any of your aspiring filmmakers out there. It's just it's so to me, so fundamental to just value your own response to things and really make that paramount. It's like that's that's the barometer. How does this make me feel? I know that every time you brought that up in the book, it jumped out at me because to me, that's it's one of those things where like you don't really know it till you're there on the set. And it's like they did the lines. It seemed like it was right, but something wasn't working. Exactly. And that's my experience on every rehearsal I do. It's like, you know, it's like I'll listen to it. I'll see it. It was kind of and I'll just be monitoring myself. What what didn't feel right there? And I'll get then I'll dig down a little bit. Well, you know, it was it kind of was working for the first page of the dialogue and then it just kind of fell off a cliff and it picked up again so okay so that's the area we got to focus on what happened why what would make these uh these six exchanges that just were kind of treading water feel you know vital and muscular and necessary and different from everything that preceded it and setting up something that's going to follow and then you really i have to really with the actors dig down granularly and try to kind of come up with an interesting subtext 
You know, what story are we telling? So if you can help an actor find those kind of things, then it can feed you as like, what might this story be about? Because I'm also believe that, you know, I've been fortunate to work on a lot of great shows with a lot of great writers, but even non-great writers often are working at a level that they may not even be conscious of. There's so much you can mine in a story if you really just scratch the surface and ask what might make this interesting. Well, what's interesting hearing this whole story to me too is that I've always... Kind of, and I've spoken to lots of episodic directors. I've always kind of been given to understand that, like, let's say you walk on, you know, whatever you walk on the set of Billions, just using it as an example, because it's something that you direct. You're not there to tell Paul Giamatti what his character's backstory is. He's already got that. And to me, the question is always like, where do you fall between being a theater director, you know, working with Pulitzer Prize material and being a traffic cop just trying to get coverage and get the scene out the door, you know, and, and make your day? And, you know, obviously it's going to be closer to some one of those on some days and closer to others on other days. But it's interesting to hear you talk about how much passion and how much thought you put into your emotional interpretation of the scene. Because a lot of times I'm afraid to think that if you kind of just went there and said a few words and made sure the blocking was okay and got through your day, you know, the scene would cut together. It would work. But to make to make it have an emotional impact on an audience member the way that you wanted to it has to have that emotional impact on you and and it's something it's an angle i've never really even thought about in terms of episodic directing yeah and it's made much more challenging by how little time you have to do these things and that's the unique art of this particular kind of directing is to is to be able to get answers internally quickly to communicate them concisely and to make them actable so uh really just one last question and that was, uh, you know, after a career of doing this, like what made you decide to write the book directing great television? About six or eight years ago, I started mentoring some young directors. I'd had several directors who over the years, you know, asked to shadow me. And I always liked, you know, I liked to, to allow that. And at a certain point about eight, I think about eight years ago, I, I met someone who was about the third or the fourth person who I thought, you know, we met certain conditions. They were a not kids. They were like late twenties, just about 30. They'd all made a film that I really liked to show talent. And by the fact that they had, they had stuck with it. I mean, they didn't just like have an idea. I want to be a director and just, they'd stuck with it for you know a couple of years, a few years. And I liked them. And I thought, you know, there's such a gap between uh, film school and getting a job and showing what you have to do when you direct I'd like to I'd like like to I'd like to help these particular individuals. So I started a mentoring group of just like four people, and uh, you know the funny thing about directing is and features as well. There's no interim position where you can direct a little. You know, you, yeah. you, you go from you go from having none of the responsibility to having all of the responsibility. Not to mention you come on the set and you're expected to have a modicum of command and leadership and vision that everybody is going to line up to follow. And uh, that's, a, that's a tough thing to learn. So I, 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 I thought of, a, you know, we'd meet like once a month for, uh, for a while and I'd come up with exercises. I remember I was working on the show House, and, uh, which was very popular at the time and they all knew it. And I said, okay, on the weekend I asked the producers if, you, if they'd allow me to come on the set and have some of these mentees of mine. And they did. So we, we, you know, we met on the set and I said, okay, uh, let's pretend this is Friday and on Monday you're going to have to show up and there's going to be four scenes to direct. I won't ask you to prepare four scenes, but pick one scene in this script and go to whichever set, you know, we're on the hospital set, uh, house's office or the operating room or whatever, or the hallway and pick a scene and spend, you know, a couple hours, you know, spend the morning, spend four hours and figure out your plan for that scene, how you would stage it how you would uh, define its key moment. How, what do you think it's really about? You know, what are the intentions of each of the actors? Because on Monday morning at 7 a.m., call time is there. The assistant directors call the actors and you have about 15 minutes to stage the scene and send them off to makeup. And if you, if you don't get it right and it has to change, that's going to really impair the rest of the day and, and, you know, be difficult. You know, sometimes you might get 30 minutes on a really hard scene, you might get a little more than that, but rarely more than that. So come in, I want you to have some answers. It's not to say that's how it's definitely going to be done. Actors will have input and hopefully you'll be able to adjust, but you'll be able to adjust a lot better if you've broken down the scene in that way so that you really know 
what the key moments are, where you want the camera to be for those key moments. And so they all went off and they kind of did it. And then we could meet and I said, okay, tell me your plan. And they describe a staging and I asked them why, you know, why, what's motivating this behavior you're, you're suggesting? Because you're going to have to get a buy-in from the actors. They have to understand why they cross at that point on that line, not just to position the camera so I can see the entrance for the next character. What, what's going to motivate them to do it? And then, okay, now how are you going to shoot this staging? How many, where would you, you know, what are the shots you imagine for this? And they might say, you know, it might be a two and a half page scene and they got 17 shots to cover. And I said, well, that's, that's going to take, you know, half your day. You, you can't afford that. It's a two and a half page scene. You know, you might have four hours for that, but, uh, you know, no more than that. So how can we consolidate your shots? So asking the questions that you don't really get asked in, in uh, film school. And, you know, I would take them to acting workshops that I sometimes, you know, guest teach at. And I'd, I'd ask them to work with the actors. And then we even I'd talk to them about how they did it. And we might even get the actors to give them feedback how they were directing actors. So I really enjoyed this process. And I'm, I'm happy to report that, you know, all of those young people have gone on to have nice careers right now. They're in good position. And then I had another experience with a young woman who was in a, uh, who again, fit the profile. She was about 30. She actually made an independent feature in Ireland. She's from San Francisco, but I thought it was excellent. And she wanted to watch the Amer- the Americans were her favorite show. And she she was in one of those diversity uh, workshops that the studios now have, and she was in the Fox one. And she said, can, can I, she called me up and said, you're about to direct The Americans. It's my favorite show. I'd love to shadow you. And she came and she shadowed me for the episode. And, and, then, it was, and then I saw the, her work. I thought it was brilliant. And about six months later, I called her up. I said, Steph, you know, you did a great feature. You, you know what you're doing. What, has your agent gotten you anything yet? And she says, well, no, I'm... Uh, you know, I'm in another, I'm now in the Warner Brothers program shadowing, and I, my heart just sank because, uh, you know, you don't get hired to direct because you shadowed somebody, and that makes sense. Why, yeah. why would anybody know that? So I happened to be in touch with the Americans for the next season, and I had a gap, and I was going to do an episode, and I had a gap in my schedule, and I, I called them up, and I, I said, you know, something just fell out. I have this gap. I'd love to do another one if you guys have a, a available. And they said, oh, we'd love that, but, you know, we have to hire a woman. And so I said, uh, Oh, well, have you considered Steph? I mean, you met her last year. And they said, has she ever done TV? And I said, no. And they said, oh, we'd never get this approved. And uh, so we can't. And I just thought that was, I mean, I understood it because there is a difference between directing an independent feature. And, but just, I just, it was the right time. I just said, you know, if you hire her, I will be with her the entire time of her prep and shoot. I'll backstop her. I'll make sure she doesn't miss a story point and that she finishes on time. And then they said, well, we can't really pay two directors. And they said, how about if you don't have to pay me? And then they said, oh, my God, you do that. And I caught myself and what have I just committed to? But it felt, <laughs> it felt right. And I felt like I would be paid much more in just uh, good feel. <laughs> In karma. <laughs> and we did this. So we did this. And Steph came on and she got, and as soon as she, and she did a great job and I supported her every way I can in the background. And as soon as she got hired for that job, not even after, even before it came out, other shows on which she shadowed hired her. They were willing. It's like they needed somebody to take a chance. Yeah. And she's gone on. Her name is Steph Green. She's She's been nominated for an Emmy for The Watchmen. She's oh, wow. directed The Mandalorian the now. The Mandalorian, yeah. The Deuce. She's she's an amazing director, and she's uh, and it, it, that's the pay I got for it. So anyway, so I love mentoring, I love teaching, and I thought you know I, there's a limit to how many people I can meet one on one. I thought you know, and actually it was Steph who suggested at first that I might write a book, and I started it about a year and a half before the pandemic. I was still full time directing, although a lot of the time directing, so I couldn't get very far into it. But as I was writing it, I just realized I don't want to write a how to book. You can't. There is no how-to to to direct. You really, it's a get to know yourself, get to know, you know, how you feel, get to know what's important, get to know how you connect a story. And I, I, it turned into a book about, you know, my experiences. So I could kind of, I hope to kind of, yeah, there are some lessons I try to impart, but I try to put the reader in the director's chair so that they can really see, oh, what are the problems that get solved and what, and, and what are the obstacles and how do you deal with that? And I just share how I did it. And then I try to share my insecurities as well as that. And 
And then the pandemic came along and it gave me a year where I couldn't work and I finished it. And as I wrote it, I really re- hoped it would have appealed to not people, not just who wanted to direct, but who really want a window into how these shows get made that they so love and, and, and insider stories, because what's also interesting and a lot of people don't really aren't conscious of is that everything that they see is, is a result of many, many conscious decisions and choices that it'd be that way and not another way. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that's what I hope the, 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 uh, the book, uh, creates that experience for people. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing the book. I, uh, I definitely enjoyed it. And uh, as uh, I am someone who has been on some TV sets and have shadowed some directors myself. So it was uh, a great look into your process and, and into, uh, honestly, into how much deeper TV directing can be than I think it often gets credit for. So I can't recommend it highly enough. Before we go, is there a, a website or something where people can, uh, can see your work? interact with you? Yeah, I have a website, just my name, danattias.com, D-A-N-A-T-T-I-A-S.com. Uh, I don't update it all that often, but... <laughs> I think the book is on there. I, I went to your website. And I, the I book is, yeah. they can, yeah, there's a link. I think it's, it's available on Amazon and, uh, and I don't do social media, so that's about the only way. You have like six extra hours in every day over all of us, so congrats for that. Well, uh, Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's great to meet you, and, uh, and I love your work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. I've really enjoyed it. So that was Dan Adias, and I hope everyone who listened to it uh, has had their heart warmed and is, uh, you know, uh, at least two or three IQ points more intelligent having listened to him. He's, he's awesome. Hey, Ben, you know what time it is? Uh, I uh, don't. <laughs> Uh, it's time to pay the bills. We Whoa, thank, I was we, doing a bit. I totally knew what time it was. <laughs> we got to thank our sponsor, uh, Aperture, a maker of fine LED lighting products. Uh, some are, that are very high-end professional products. Others that are, uh, you know, more, more entry-level. Today, I'm going to talk about one of the more entry-level products, which is called a Amaran P60C. And this is like a tiny little one-by-one sort of panel. So like one foot by one foot. They, they basically took their more expensive professional Nova panel and shrunk it down and don't charge all that much money for it. I think I may have mentioned it in a previous time, but it's worth mentioning again because it's $349. And when nice, I, I mean, there's people who are, you know, granted they'll, they'll go to Amazon, they'll find some cheap, uh, really low quality light. They'll spend maybe that much or less on Amazon. There is no reason to do that. This is an, a uh, 60 to 80 watt you know, it kind of ranges depending on how many LEDs are being used at, at, at one time. Color tunable uh, RGB panel that's very small, runs off of RGB, batteries. Oh, nice. Yeah, I was going to ask, I was yeah. gonna ask if it was bicolor and I was afraid that I would sound uh, out of out of touch. So I'm glad you, you went with your RGB. It is. And it's got color gel presets and a bunch of other, you know, cool stuff. Uh, you can get it at Hot Rod Cameras. I know there, I think there's about 20 left. I think we've blown through about half of them this week. But wow. uh, uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, it's it's an inexpensive light, and I see a lot of people get these really junky video lights and and use them for all kinds of things that are not very bright and they they don't have a lot of functions. This is kind of fulfilling on that promise, and you might think three hundred and fifty dollars I could get almost a PlayStation with that kind of money, but but uh, but no, you can't. You can't. They're like five hundred bucks or something these days. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> but uh, also I don't I don't know. This. It's like I have a choice between lighting an interview or playing red dead redemption i don't know what i don't know what's on playstation <laughs> you're, you're so uncool not a gamer a- anyway i'm just saying that for less than the price of a playstation you can buy a, a really high quality light that will help you for all kinds of uh, all kinds of things it doesn't take up much space and you can stick it under the bed and it's it's, it's a cool thing it's a cool light check it out you're, check you're it really out. selling this to the college out. dorm crowd you're really you're you know you're, you're... <laughs> that's kind of who the youtube people are kind of coming on strong and we're getting you know more and more of them listening to our show but, uh, you know and, like a good one by one panel you know if you had two or three of those that's like a basic interview kit like and you know you will not be scoffed at showing up on a professional job with a kit of these lights and there's a little soft box available it's not from you know very much money and it, it, it you know if you need some help figuring out what you need call hot rod cameras call you know call me we will get you going and get you set up with this and uh you know figure out all the things that you need to to make it work 
You guys are on fire. It's 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 crazy how many it, like you're 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 going through those things. <laughs> Between yeah, Aperture. Well, I found out we are the number one Aperture dealer on the West Coast at Hot Rod Cameras. We we are buying their products and stacking to the ceilings. Quite literally, I go into the office and go, "Holy crap! I can't believe how much Aperture stuff is in here." But uh, <laughs> <laughs> at the same time, that's kind of a good thing. That means we're we're moving a lot of them. They're 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 going through. So that that is one of the real highlights of uh, of uh, what we're doing these days. Aperture is really um, actually, you know, we still a lot of other lighting brands as well but aperture has been uh, a really great partner for us and uh, and they um yeah make good products so hard to complain nice and now short ends all right so ben it is time for our famed short end you know segment of the show what, what is your short end this week well, I hate to keep going back to this well, because the reasons for talking about guns on sets is, uh, you know, dealing with the tragedy on the set of Rust, which, you know, is still in the news because we're still hearing new stuff about it every day. And, you know, we had you and I had even talked about possibly making that our close focus. But it's like by the time this comes out, even more stuff will come out. But because I'm interested in this stuff, I've been uh, looking more and more into the various alternatives that we have to using real guns or guns that can fire bullets on movie sets. And our friend Jeremy Galise actually posted a thing that I thought was pretty interesting. And it was Adam Savage, formerly of Mythbusters. He has a show called Tested. Mm. And you can uh, go online and find it. We can put the link in the show notes. But if you look it up anyway, it's Adam Savage Chess Weta Workshops Machine Gun Props. And what Weta, uh, which is Peter Jackson's special effects, visual effects, everything company, uh, what they've done is they've come up with this, basically the guts of a gun. What's the one thing, actually in my Twitter uh, screed, the one thing I didn't bring up was recoil, which, I mean, I did sort of bring it up that airsoft guns have a little bit of recoil and actors can sort of lean into it a little bit and kind of sell it a little bit better. But like very realistic recoil, yeah, you're not going to get that out of an airsoft gun. And so these people at Weta kind of tackled this problem and they were tackling it back as long ago as the first avatar movie so they've kind of come up with this thing that kind of they they can sort of gut certain guns i don't know how many of the guns they they show a few of them and some of them are like science fiction guns that don't really exist and some are real guns but it's like an actuator or something that goes inside the gun and gives an outrageously realistic recoil and in addition they put an led light down the barrel so when it fires it actually looks like muzzle flash already like you're getting the lens flare you're getting any lighting change in the in the scene anything you would get out of it and basically he he was saying you can put in more leds wherever you would get muzzle flash so you you know you can just stick more leds like if they would if the muzzle had you know like holes in it around the side to kind of discharge some of the gas as it was coming out, you can put more LEDs in there to, to emphasize or, you know, whatever, to, to change the shape of it. And I just watched it and I was like, I feel like we need more interest in this kind of stuff because, again, it's one of those things where you go like, OK, you know, we're pretending we can pretend better on sets. We can do a better job pretending without blanks. Here's yet another way that, you know, I don't know how much these guns cost. I bet they cost less than hiring an armorer and asking your crew to stand down for 30 minutes while you have a safety meeting. I bet they're way less expensive. And I feel like, you know, what it's hopefully if there is a silver lining to the rust tragedy, it's that more and more of these solutions are going to come to the fore. And so when you're making a movie at any budget level at all, you'll be able to get your I mean, you can already get your hands on stock assets relatively inexpensively to add muzzle flash and smoke and stuff in post. But hopefully we're going to be moving into a world where like we just don't even have this conversation. And and I feel terrible because I don't want to put armorers out of work, but maybe armorers can learn how to specialize in maintaining and running these guns and they can be specialized props people. And, you know, they, they won't have the fun of going out and firing real guns all the time. But uh, nobody's safety will be impinged upon and and i think that you know everyone who brings up that you know rust if you count rust it's like you know one person every decade or something uh there's a fatality on set but if you start including like minor injuries or hearing loss or there's a lot of health uh problems with firing these guns on set a lot in my opinion and i think you know Finding a way to not do it is just a much better idea, in my opinion. So check out this Adam Savage tested video. I think you'll find it uh, very interesting. I actually watched that video. Yeah, it was was pretty cool. 
I love Adam Savage. He's such a cool guy. And, you know, and y- you can't accuse him of being anti-gun. Like, how many how many actual guns did they fire on uh, on Mythbusters over the years? Somebody was asking me on Facebook, you know, why would you fire a gun on a set? And the first thing that came to mind was Mythbusters. Like, I don't want to I don't want shows like Mythbusters to not be able to do stuff with guns. I just think that it has to be done safely. And, and you know, there, there, of course, have been shows that are all around all about guns, especially some television shows. So there's a show called Gunny Time, which, uh, yeah. you know, which, of, of course, uh, shot by by one of our clients. You know, th- those shows are about are about guns. And, you know, as Americans, guns are in, in <laughs> thoroughly interwoven into the fabric of our society. <laughs> and um, I, I would say that to try to uh, extricate them from the motion picture and television industry is. Uh, well, I, I, mean, I, I, I would say as an entertainment device, as an entertainment device, I'm not, uh, I, you know, and completely that's that's not going away. I think that there's oh, ways no, we can I mean, meet. well, and, and there have been people more than one person like jumped on my fa- on my uh, Twitter thread and was like, you know, maybe if we weren't so into guns and I'm like, it's a different problem, like telling stories with guns in it or not telling stories with guns in it. Yeah. You know, y- you got to sell the world on why we want to see more Kramer versus Kramer and less John Wick. But maybe John Wick versus Kramer versus Kramer. <laughs> I'm in. Um, but uh, no, but seriously, like, you know, I mean, to me, it's like, I'm not here to tell anyone what story to tell. I'm not here to say don't have guns in your stuff. I've made stuff with guns in it. I get it. I like watching. I like watching action movies as much as the next person. I don't only watch those things. Somebody was like equating them to seat belts or smoking. And it's like, eh. You know, the thing is, like, how many storylines hinged on someone smoking a cigarette? I'm sure someone will come up with one or two. But the the gun changes the story because it kills people. It's it's uh, it's an easy crutch for a writer to be like, I, yeah, and then so-and-so pulls out a gun, <laughs> and the whole dynamic of the scene changes, you know? I, I like your mashup idea, though. I, I really kind of want to see now Mr. and Mrs. Smith goes to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, sorry. That, that, that's, that, awesome. that, that's 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 like that. Well, you know why you enjoyed it so much? You are now a dad, and this is a total corny dad joke that was also movie nerd dumb as well. So there you go. I'll do it. Mo- most of our listeners are going to be like, "Who the yeah. what the huh? shut up, so, old dudes?" Yeah. So Ilya, <laughs> enough about guns. Yeah. What is your short end today? So sticking with sort of my tradition now of doing something tech in the short ends segment, GoPro, uh, DJI, these uh, GoPro hasn't really had serious competition in the action camera space in a long time. But just this week, DJI announced their Action 2, which is like a sub miniature version of a GoPro camera. It's smaller. It's mm, yeah, inherently that. waterproof, but it does also have a microphone. But what's really different is it's got a big sensor, a pretty big sensor inside of that. Whereas um, GoPro is going with a smaller sensor and packing in more pixels. And I, I will tell you, the, the DJI Action 2 costs less. And I'm going to say for most people, actually is probably going to be a, a, a better buy. I think the DJI Action 2 looks like to me it has usurped GoPro's reign as the best sort of mini action camera out there. And it seems like it's got a lot more features, a lot more function. And I have yet to do any sort of side by side. But just looking at what is out there, I, I feel like calling the race. I feel like calling it and saying, you know, GoPro, as soon as the, the world realizes how cool this thing is, it's going to be really tough for them to, to keep it going other than, than living on the, the brand name recognition of what's come before. I mean, that's what it is. It, GoPro yeah. and GoPro has a look. There is like a GoPro look. And DJI oh, sure. does not. I wouldn't say there's a specific look to DJI. DJI. But, well, it just their stuff looks really some com- nice. There's some comparison stuff out there, and I, I would will tell you that the look between them is more or less identical. Oh, it's really? Less, yes, it's very identical. But in the certain ways, uh, DJI has some advantages, and you might claim like, oh, well, you know, the hyperlapse mode of the GoPro is superior, or you might claim, oh, we, we got more resolution in there. For what most people do, I'm going to say that those two things are pretty small pluses compared to all the, the, the pluses that the little DJI naturally waterproof and now magnet into all of your mount type of things, including like you're going to stick a camera anywhere on your, your person by having a little magnet inside of your shirt and it just like bloop, it pops right onto that and you can have a camera anywhere. And they really do some stuff like that, which is kind of incredible. How, how much uh, is the new one? Have they said? Yeah, I think it's like Four ninety nine or something like that. I, mm. I got to double check, or maybe it's four, maybe it's three ninety nine. But I know it's about a hundred dollars cheaper than the the GoPro. So, so Ben, hey, uh, where can people find you if they want some more Ben Rock in their life? 
go to benrockonline.com. And if you're on Facebook and you want to endure yeah. yourself to me, I, I created a random group called Needs a Werewolf, and we pitch ideas for movies and add werewolves into them. So you can just go ahead on there, and I, I'm the admin, and uh, you know, pitch me your version of. People have already done all of like the Schindler's Lists and the Sophie's Choices. But, you know, find a good movie. And if you want to, you know, for extra bonus, uh, Photoshop a werewolf into the poster, as some of our people have been doing. Uh, I'd say go to Ben Rock Online or Needs a Werewolf on Facebook. And uh, th- those are the two best places to find me. Well, you will find Ben there, but you won't find me. I am not a member of the Needs a Werewolf, but... Uh... <laughs> Your wife is. <laughs> that wouldn't surprise me. Anyway, so uh, you can find me over at Hot Rod Cameras, hotrodcameras.com, and all the usual socials, uh, sort of like at Hot Rod Cameras. You can, you can find your way to me. And uh, let's thank some people. Ben, who do we have to thank this week? Uh, first off, as always, let's thank Alana Cody, who has kicked all the ass, who set up that interview with Dan Adius, a uh, fascinating guy. And uh, he, he seemed really excited to talk about Silver Bullet, because I don't think a lot of people ask him about Silver Bullet. They're probably more interested in hearing about Homeland. But yeah. sort of like when we had Wally Pfister on the show, and I wanted to talk about Roger Corman. <laughs> to me, that's more interesting. <laughs> anyway, we should thank Kay's Alatracci, who uh, is clearly now regularly listening to the show. And I know this because he called me out on something that I had recommended on the show and did not recommend to him in person <laughs> oh wow okay yeah wow and uh and lastly but never leastly we should thank ben katz our amazing editor who i uh, hopefully we didn't make his life too hard today but maybe we did i don't know all right well oh, thanks very much and i'm really glad that this one is in the books and don't forget if you're still listening in to the sound books. of my voice if you're still listening to the sound of my voice, we have a book giveaway on Instagram. So don't forget to go to our Instagram and enter the uh, the giveaway for the cool new book. And regardless, check out Directing Great Television, written by Dan Adius. Absolutely. Thank you. And we will see you next week at the Cinematography Podcast. Thanks for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Listening.